uh, it uh, i mean anyone who aspires to make it big in the corporate world it's a dream come true uh, for anyone to study in uh, Uh, hi, uh, good evening all of you. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you back here again uh, for the session. Uh, what we're going to do today is uh, uh, we're going to have two sets of cases that we are supposed to do today. One of them is uh, the U.S. airline industry and the other one is the Intel Corporation. Uh, so these are the two cases uh, that we would actually uh, pick up today. Uh, but for, for the first thing that we do to, during the day is the Intel Corporation case. And of course, uh, you must have noticed a small change that we have made. Uh, and that is that we are going to have a small change in our uh, session timing, so, so from 6 o'clock till 9 o'clock. Uh, but today's session is going to be a little short. I have to actually rush out to Chandigarh, and uh, so we will actually try to close the session by about 8.20, 8.25 today. Uh, so I will not be in a position to actually extend the session, so we will uh, uh, probably uh, do a cover-up uh, of this uh, thing sometime next week, uh, wherein we cover up a time that we are going to lose out in today's session. Uh, so th this is what we're going to do, and uh, uh, yes, yeah, so I have Poorna uh, who's raised her hand, so we'll start with Poorna today, if she has some issues, and then we'll uh, quickly start. Okay, now the first question, I hope uh, you've read the cases on Intel and uh, US airline industry, and uh, uh, we will actually begin with that then. Uh, yes, Poorna. Uh, Poorna, sorry, I'm, uh, you're not audible. Yeah, you've, you've read the case, right? Uh, am I audible? Oh, yes, you are. Yeah. Yeah, uh, you want to share some ideas on that? Yeah. Okay, we will start the discussion. Said, uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, we'll start the discussion with you. Don't worry. So, uh, okay. Uh, okay. If you really look at uh, the, the questions for all of you, actually, if you really look at the Intel uh, case, uh, I really need to understand what's happening in this uh, company. In fact, if you really look at the time frame that this company talks about, this uh, company is typically talking about a huge time frame. It's about a 35, 37 year time frame that they are talking about. So from 1968 till about 2003. And uh, there seems to be different sets of pastures or different sets of eras for this organization. Uh, so things have really changed for this organization over a period of time. There have been a lot of upheavals or whatever. But I, I need to understand what's the challenge here, what, what's the decision that we are really trying to take in this case, what, what's the business uh, situation or what are the, uh, if, you, if you were the CEO of this company, how would you actually tackle the issues and so on and so forth. So Poona, we'll uh, start with you. So what, what do you think this case is all about? Uh, how it has, it has increased its spectrum into different uh, 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 for example, uh, memory chips and uh, communication, networking, and uh, different. Uh, uh, according to the market, uh, how uh, they have entered into several fields and how they have improved their uh, uh, brand name. How uh, it's all about that. Okay. So what what you're saying primarily primarily is. They're like there were different sets of products that this company actually got into, right? So pro probably from say what you say is DRAMs and then they have the microprocessor. Yeah. It yes. Micro yes. And w w what they have actually done uh, with these two products, how they've actually grown, right? So you're talking about the growth story here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Anything else that you're really wanting to talk about? Uh, trademarks. Okay, so there are branding, trademarks, branding. Interesting. Okay, so we, 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 perfect. So if, if you really look at this whole thing that has happened within this industry, uh, the industry is actually uh, what you call got punctuated at two different sets of stages. Uh, when you talk about these two different sets of stages somewhere, uh, what do you think was happening to Intel? Uh, because if you look at Intel, Intel was not doing well in micro. Uh, sorry, in DRAMs. And then it did accept yeah. yes, and it did exceptionally well in microprocessors. So I, I need to understand what what is actually happening here. So let, let me understand 
from your point of view, what was this DRAM industry all about? Uh, it's all about uh, uh, memory uh, memory chips. Uh, all the Silicon Valley companies uh, are focused about that. Mm -hmm. and, uh, they have uh, they have done a uh, lot of investment in R&D to improve the uh, DRAMs and all, and finally they they have taken step to uh, move forward uh, into microprocessor business uh, according to the market situations prevailed in that at that time. Okay, uh, what do you think was the strategy for Intel in DRAM business? What were they doing? Actually, uh, uh, they have main focus on uh, invention of uh, new uh, new things and upgrading the technologies and. Uh, okay, please go ahead. Uh, how we need their so they have um, a focus on innovation, and, right? Uh, yeah, right. Okay. And manufacturing sectors. And w what do you mean by this? What and do you mean by uh, manufacturing? What, what, what do you want to say here? Uh, actually, they have started uh, manufacturing uh, uh, sectors and uh, they have uh, started uh, many uh, number of uh, what's called uh, Outlets uh, to produce this DRAMs. Mm -hmm. Not only DRAMs, but microprocessors. And okay. And well, what, their, what else was happening within uh, the industry? Well, well, what was their strategy for DRAMs? If I really ask you, if you really had to uh, give me an analysis for the strategy of Intel in the DRAM business, right? Uh, what do you? How would you actually make an assessment here? Why do you think Intel was doing well or why do you think it was not doing well, who was the competition, who were the customers and so on and so forth. In fact, if you if you really remember, we, we actually talked about one simple framework in the beginning that we called as the 4C framework. I think we did talk about this uh, simple framework and that is what strategy is all about. What we wanted to say is there is somebody called as the customer. Of course, there is a context and context okay. means the operating environment. And then of course, there is something called competition and the company. So three of them are something called as the external factors and one of them is a internal factor. What do you think was, how would you make an assessment for Intel on these four parameters at least for something called as the DRAM business and how would you actually tell me something about it? Uh, for example, if we take uh, let, let, let's business, go, the customers. Yeah, let's go by one by one. So, okay, so we are talking about DRAMs and we have somebody called as customers. Okay. So, tell me something about yeah. customers of DRAM. Uh, the customers are like uh, payroll, uh, something related to uh, some medical records and uh, wow. uh, people wants to save a uh, uh, lot of uh, data, uh, they opt for uh, DRAMs. Mm -hmm. uh, those are the customers for are you sure DRAM about it? business. Are you sure about it? Yeah. Okay. Uh, where is it mentioned in the case? Okay, I, I'll get back to you, uh, Purna. Uh, I'll actually get back to you. Think through this. Okay. Yes? Uh, let, let me just okay. go to uh, Rajiv now. Uh, Am I audible? Uh, yes, Rajiv. Okay. Uh, coming uh, to your question about the DRAM business. Yeah. Uh, technology kind of discovered, you know, more you know, in fact, discovered in the 40s, but as the case says, you know, started getting uh, matured in the 70s. The customers were really the OEMs, the engineers at the OEMs. 
exactly which wanted memory yeah which wanted memory devices so it may be difficult to name exact customers i would say the whole you know engineering industry at that point of time which was making equipments which relied on some type of a of a fixed memory device okay uh it could so be a calculator or a computer been, or whatever we might want to say right yeah in that probably yeah those times computers were probably lesser so yes calculating devices probably equipments which relied on instructions to function okay so could have been some electronic equipments who knows could have been some people like siemens etc who would write uh, stuff for machines to work okay so and could have been some american companies i mean that uh, what uh, i gathered to me and there were this was we, derived we much demand. so much in the, hmm. and do you think it was derived demand or it was something else um what do you mean by derived demand professor okay um, derived is like okay now it's not direct demand from the customer uh, there is something like a customer and a consumer here right so the customer and the consumer would be different in this case the consumer that's right so, so the the consumer is the individual but yes the, the actual customer for the dram is consumer electronics computers telecom whatever machine yes. so you would call this derived demand exactly, right exactly because there is a customer and a consumer layer that is actually happening here right so because because if you really look at it they, this kind of a product could be used in multiple sets of things yes multiple sets of devices Correct. Exactly. Correct. so that is how it was coming from okay yeah, and you were saying something on maturity Correct. of the industry but and yeah it's an interesting you know uh, definitely a very interesting case to read through 30 35 years of any company's history but focusing on the dram phase of it i think uh, if i just look at the four c's in a slightly different order start from the internal one the company okay. was essentially uh very good at you know trying to experiment and develop the right technology or the right ip for this business so i would would say so this is a high technology company and it was trying multiple techniques to figure out which is the best way or best way to write this dram uh, technology so it was very good in ip i think somewhere it says uh uh of the kind of uh, this is a complex technology having over 100 patents was common so they uh and so they were so on the technology side and you know uh, leveraging technology of other players i think the company was very good this was one mm -hmm. um the second fact comes that this was an industry which required huge capex okay um and uh, i don't know how but intel probably being a startup you know figured out uh, uh, a, w a way to get this maybe through venture capital but what comes out uh, in so it was definitely an, an an industry at the start which had a high barrier to entry mm -hmm. heavy capex mm -hmm. uh, huge amount of technology um it also mentions that the japanese were far excellent in the manufacturing techniques of this um, this memory device okay so you 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 want to say that the critical success the factor the, let's say the competition okay yeah and then of course there is something called so, a critical success factor in this industry well, what do you think is the critical correct. success factor in the industry here well uh reading the case through it looks at the critical success factors in this industry is uh, is a technology b speed uh, because you know this this uh, as the dram was developing you know while the company spent a lot of time and effort in it and the competition was the japanese which were multi billion dollar uh, you know conglomerates with much lower manufacturing cost i guess intel never made too much money out of this mm -hmm. because then you know the whole industry uh discovered the eprom technology which is what the engineers were more happy about okay you know the engineers that are customers so, because this industry is, is you know it's all about continuous technological innovation absolutely which really which really you know forces a company to continuously keep thinking ahead and uh, uh you know um 
I mean, I, I don't have any right uh, answers here, but, you know, in an industry requiring high capex, but with a continuously changing technology, what should be the right strategies to pursue? But mm -hmm. coming back to your DRAM phase, there was high competition. Okay. okay. Uh, the, con the customer and context existed in the sense that uh, while there were a few players, the Japanese had an edge in manufacturing costs. Okay. And... Uh, you know, there was probably in the context no company being able to, you know, continuously lead that technology from one generation to the next, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I don't know how to define that technically as to what type of a context is that, where uh, you have a cost leader, but, you know, the, the, there are rapid changes happening. Okay. Uh, so who really is the leader? Um, okay, l l let's, let's dig a little deeper into this. So, if, if you really look at this case, what, 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 there are a few points that you've said. Like one, this company is actually focusing on technology development, right? And during the DRAM phase, it's a high-tech company, uh, right? And uh, when you talk about the customers, it was something like the OEMs and so on and so forth. And then, of course, you talk about it, it needs huge levels of capital to be successful in this business. And then if you talk about competition, mm -hmm. and you're saying it was about speed, it was about technology, it was about manufacturing costs being less. But if you really look at it, mm -hmm. if I really want to actually pinpoint an idea here, what do you think was actually happening? For what reasons do you think Japanese were able to do exceptionally well, and whereas Intel was not able to do well in this industry? Where, where do you think Intel was starting to miss the boat? Because if you really look at, now you, you have to make a comparison here. What, what were the Japanese doing right, and what do you think uh, were... Uh, what, what do you think this American company was doing wrong? Okay, uh, I have two two inputs here. Uh, one, the Japanese DRAM producers, which was the Hitachis, the Mitsubishis, the Fujitsu, etc. They were probably more, as written in the case, they were working very closely with the Japanese equipment manufacturers. Okay. So, while it must have been us, you know, I, I'm not a, a, a I'm not an uh, electronics or a computer engineer, so I don't know much about the technology. But probably it's a technology that can be customized and made better uh, uh, if you work closely with customers. And I guess Japanese were doing it better. Okay. Plus, the Japanese had uh, you know a much lower manufacturing cost or much better manufacturing methods, uh, much more disciplined approach to manufacturing, etc. I'm just you know, pointing on what's written. So, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, so okay. I guess these were the two edges. Okay, let, let me ask this Japanese question uh, to a few more people and let me see what they have to say. I yeah. somehow disagree with you a bit on this, but we'll actually come back to you, Rajiv, on this. Uh, yes? Okay. Okay. Yes, Amit. I... <laughs> Hi. I know what I uh, basically. Uh, hello, am I audible? Yes, yes, absolutely, Amit. Please go ahead. Hello. All right, all right. So uh, specifically, you know, uh, if we talk about uh, what specifically, uh, you know, the Japanese companies or uh, their, their products is, uh, you know, if, if we talk about superiority in terms of that, uh, what I uh, feel is their products were cheaper in the market as compared to the Intel products. Uh, they were ab able to offer uh, their products uh, cheaper as compared to uh, what Intel is doing. Initially, when Intel la launched this uh, uh, 1103, that's one kilo kilobit DRAM, that product were, uh, was actually popular and successful in market. But uh, later on, you know, uh, I will say uh, they were uh, they were they were a bit slow in uh, uh, getting into the momentum, and uh, they were. Uh, as we had discussed the case of uh, Maruti last time, you know, uh, I, I think they lacked uh, proper vision, you know, for, uh, for next 10 years down the line, what kind of products they are uh, uh, supposed to launch in near future. You know, their one uh, kill, uh, their RAM successors like 1K or 2K or 4K or 6, 16K, uh, they were a little bit slow or uh, they were a little bit late in launching those products in the market. Uh, this is the this is one thing, and uh, the other reasons could be like uh, uh, like bank funding or uh, patenting or etc cetera, etc. Cetera. But the Japanese were certainly superior in technology, and uh, 
yes uh, uh, you know they, they had their own uh, customers their their customers were using their products uh, very widely if we uh, uh, talk about japanese market their ma their market was actually isolated so their customers were uh, heavily using their products and uh, uh, you know their in fact their competitors were uh, supporting their technology you know in in building up uh, concepts of photolithography or those okay. kind of instruments mm -hmm. so so but my major focus would be on uh, offering cheaper products you know if if they have the technology then they will certainly offer Okay. Uh, cheaper products. One more pointed question: How do you think they were able to offer cheaper products? What was the differentiating factor between the Japanese and the Americans? Uh, what do you think? How was Intel different from the Japanese companies here? Very simple question. Yeah, in, uh, you know, uh, I'll, I'll just quote an example of uh, a 64 kilobit uh, DRAM. You know, they have launched actually. Uh, in 1980, the, the, the actual product was, uh, let's say, $28, and uh, just after two years, it, it uh, came back to like $5 or so. So their, their product was going down and da down. Intel actually could not uh, afford to uh, offer their customers low, um, cheaper products. Or uh, if we if we compare the technology of uh, like 64K RAM offered by both the companies. And then I think Japanese uh, were more successful in offering cheaper products. Why? Why? How were they able to do it? Huh? What was it that the Japanese companies were doing that Intel was not doing? Yeah, I think uh, they, they are mass two producing points. their products. Uh, they, two they points. Are. Two points. You just have to say two points, not more than five words in one point. <laughs> uh, I will say low cost in mass production. <laughs> okay, so you're saying mass production. <laughs> So that is one. Yeah. So mass production was going to go give you low price, right? That that's or the low cost for the product. Yes. Okay. Anything else that comes? Yes, to exactly. Um, so, uh, uh, if if we have if we are producing uh, number of products uh, uh, and at the same venture, we we don't have to uh, spend a lot of amount in uh, you know hiring a separate venture or uh, having a separate venture for that for that product. We can utilize the same uh, resources and all those stuff. So I, th I think uh, uh, okay. uh, because for uh, manufacturing these semiconductor devices, we have to have a long, uh, sorry, big uh, clean room and all those superior technology for uh, so Okay. So you're, you're getting into the manufacturing process. But anyways, I'll come back to you. Uh, th thanks, Amit, for this. Yes, Suresh. Uh, the key differentiators how uh, the Japanese uh, were different uh, uh, from the Americans uh, and the Intel. Uh, the head of Japanese manufacturing, Intel Japanese manufacturing, has clearly acknowledged uh, saying that uh, uh, they were uh, further ahead in terms of the Japanese were further ahead in terms of uh, manufacturing. For example, they followed a disciplined approach in manufacturing and they were using statistical process methods. Mm -hmm. and, uh, basically, that would avoid any defects and uh, return of, I mean, faulty products uh, released to the market and thereby tarnishing the brand uh, name. So, uh, the Japanese got it right first time and every time. So, uh, controlled manufacturing processes and methodologies uh, kind of are a key differentiator in the Japanese uh, manufacturing. Uh, second thing is uh, the Japanese uh, had their supplier relationships, which Intel didn't have. Mm -hmm. uh, th and that's one of the reasons uh, speed to market was able to kind of, you know, meet the requirements of the uh, OEMs and customers. Uh, so, they leveraged on the supplier relationships, the Japanese manufacturers. Uh, the third thing is uh, the Japanese, uh, uh, like NEC, Fujitsu, Hitachi, had collaborations uh, with the Japanese OEMs. And that's where that collaboration also with the OEMs helped them to kind of better understand the requirements of the OEMs and thereby uh, uh, pr deliver to understand the needs and deliver to their requirements. So that was another differentiator in terms of collaborations with the OEMs. Which Intel, uh, there isn't any anywhere mentioned that Intel was doing uh, these uh, uh, hardware relationships. And uh, another last uh, differentiator, I think, is what what Intel has clearly acknowledged is they were much behind in the learning curve. So learning curve of Japanese was extremely high 
and that's one of the reasons why they kind of you know were able to target at 64k rams when intel was still falling behind uh, in terms of design and timelines okay so uh, that was another differentiator of yeah uh, very interesting sets of points but now if you really look at it there is this player called intel where which is the company which probably started this industry because they're the pioneers here right yeah. and uh, still they yeah. failed Uh, so what what you're saying is one one point that I realize is what you're saying is the way they were really structuring the business the Jap the way the Japanese were structuring their business in terms of their relationship with suppliers uh, to something like the process of manufacturing that they were actually have having but there was something else that was actually yeah. that Intel got wrong one of course like one thing that emerges very very clearly here is that it was something like uh, uh, what Intel was doing is that Intel was not able to take its uh, what do you call product from the drawing board to the, to the manufacturing system in a very quick manner so what what happened is like they were not able to do those learning curves as you are saying because they were not really able to reduce the cost of manufacturing and so on and so forth but there was one more critical error uh, that intel probably made and what was that critical error i think i mean if we look at where uh, they were Less focus, or they were not focus, is uh, uh, of the four C's is the the company itself in terms of. I mean, it was more reactive probably than proactive. Uh, is what I can. Okay. Uh, how how were they? Was, how were they reactive? Uh, why? Why? Or why? Why do you say that? They were, uh, probably they were not structured as an organization, and I mean they were too much focusing on innovations at every time. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and le let's focus on the customer aspect of the four Cs, uh, and 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 they they felt that they had enough innovation that could keep them as the market leaders for a long time. But do you think they were doing the right sets market. of innovation? Uh, I don't think so because they just survived on what the initial in innovations that they had done, but there was no. Uh, uh evol evolution in the innovation process okay. there wasn't that kind of you know uh mm -hmm. now okay now tell me like rajiv actually made a very interesting point that this is a high tech industry right so we, we now we are actually debating something very interesting here is it really a high tech industry or is it just a misnomer or is it a business which is more towards the way commodity business is actually run because if you are really talking about that you are competing on say cost and you are actually going to ramp up your capacities to bring down your prices and you are actually going to have something like learning curve effect uh, and your product differentiation is negligible so do you think this is a commodity business or a high tech business i think it's uh, both to some extent because uh, having the uh, uh, the uh, upgraded version or whatever the latest uh, product in the market at the same time uh, have mass production of the same is what drives uh, and keeps it as the market leader mm -hmm. uh, probably uh, one thing intel had is only the innovation part and not the mass production in terms of meeting the customer demands uh, but japanese i think had a mixture of both uh, both in terms of innovation uh, and uh, mass production and cost okay and uh, i'll get back to you uh, suresh on this i think is also on the quality i think okay quality of also of the product of the japanese was another differentiator so you feel quality that plays a very key role so quality of japanese was impeccable yeah okay great uh, so uh, I, i'll actually get back to you on this uh, let, let me just go to somebody else and see what they have to say uh, okay we we have uh, visu from uh, chennai so yeah yes visu Yeah. Um, am I audible? Uh, absolutely, Vishu. Okay. The difference which I am seeing between this Japanese and American, it's a production yield. Uh, their yield is high as seventy to eighty percent, and uh, compared to US, it's a forty to fifty uh, to sixty percent only. Also, uh, during the DRAM period, uh, the perception about the technology and perception about the customer of Intel didn't. fit with the reality so they were lacking behind uh, whatever the product they are delivering the competitors they were uh, releasing the next version of uh, 
products in the uh, earlier phase mm-hmm. so they couldn't be able to compete with uh, their competitors in that area okay. could you repeat this I, i actually lost the argument yeah oh, okay no uh, their perception about the technology and the perception about their customer uh, didn't rea- fit with the reality oh okay so they were they were uh, investing lot of time and money in their r&d but they couldn't be able to release those products on time so by their competitors were releasing the products the higher end products much ahead of they release into the uh, market mhm okay now what what's wrong with the perception of the market i okay, i need to actually get this one right what was wrong in the perception of the market with intel um they were uh, concentrating more uh, designing the high end one they were concentrating directly go to the 256k but by the time the market was captured by other competitors by releasing 32k and 64k d rams oh so you you feel also, that intel was uh, focusing on higher uh, uh, size or bigger size memory chips or it was doing something else no see their core competencies during the same 1968 and the 1970 period they were developed the microprocessor also but uh, they didn't realize that one as a, their core competency but they were much investing money and effort and uh, developing the drams mm-hmm. okay uh, we we should uh, good points i'll get back to you on this let, let me just build it up uh, out here on this uh, in fact uh, we we have uh, meena from uh, delhi Uh, so let's see yes meena <clears throat> yeah uh, i would like to point out i mean uh, why japanese were uh, superior i mean why uh, they were much ahead of intel in terms of um, yeah, especially during the dram uh, mass production one is in the context that they are operating see the japanese uh, conglomerates they were able to you know get uh, cheaper capital by uh, by, by way of bank loans and uh, cheaper labor so that i think intel was uh, uh, i mean have to rely on their own capital rather than loans so that is one point and another thing is these japanese conglomerates also have other business interests in consumer electronics computers and other areas and they were able to vertically integrate the drams with the other business Mm-hmm. so this entire thing uh, uh, so they were uh, they were able to increase lot of efficiencies due to this integration to due to this uh, synergy i mean th- that they were able to capture on this on these uh, different lines of business okay and and i mean that is a, that is the second point and uh, also their uh, uh, japanese is i think famous for their uh, various uh, quality processes like kaizen and tqm which they must have i think uh, implemented in their uh, production process in their quality control and uh, everything so all these led to i think uh, they are being much ahead of uh, um, i mean ahead of uh, um, intel in terms of you know time to market in all their um, in all their products i mean that is the point i want to make um, okay. as to why uh, japanese have an edge over intel in uh, okay. dram okay, okay. Mm-hmm. interesting points uh, meena i'll i'll actually ask go to rajiv now and see what rajiv has to say about what you're saying uh, yes uh, rajiv yeah um clearly uh, cost of capital was also a prime uh, reason why japanese would have had an initial edge in uh, keeping the cost of their uh, uh, drams low uh the manufacturing difference has been talked about by all of us the two points uh, uh that we, you know deserve more discussion which is one is your question whether this was actually a technology industry or a commodity industry yes now how does one judge an industry where a product sells for $28 in 1980 and in 2 years sells for $6 so that's a almost a 1/4 price change. so what do you say you have to make a comment But on how this how does one yeah i mean that's one data point if if i look at this point i would say this is a commodity industry we are operating in we are all talking cost but if you look at that interesting graph that we see which is on exhibit 4 yeah where we see that a product starts you know let's say the 1k dram and it it picks up in volumes and you know even when it is selling there is a there is a new launch of a of a higher version of it 
and this trend just keeps continuing. Okay. Um, and again, you know, to bring a product, if there is a certain lead time, which means, you know, by the time the first product's in the market, the company is already working on its next version or the next level of technology. So by definition, that is a high technology company. You don't do that in coal. You don't do that in steel. So those are really commodities. Mm -hmm. But okay, can I ask you, you know, a question here? If, if this, yeah, yeah. How can yeah. you differentiate brands? Uh, power, speed, uh, capacity. Okay, what else? I mean, everybody talks about these two, three things. Power, speed and capacity. Every company talks about it. Whether it's, if you really look at the industry mm -hmm. today, whether you talk about Kingston, you talk about Samsung, you talk about anybody in the market, they actually talk about power, speed and capacity. How do you differentiate this problem? Then I would say functionality. And then you, then I would okay, say functionality. Okay, now all memories will function the same way, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, but <laughs> tell me, like, but then, like, okay. I'm just, you know, since we have the benefit of uh, foresight, so you know, EEPROM came. Yeah. So. Okay, so let, let's go a little deeper. Allowed, on this. not just yeah. Let, let's go a little deeper on this. This is a very interesting point, you know. If you really look at hmm. an industry, I think there are a lot of times when people hmm. would say that there is a high tech company and a low tech company. Right? How do you differentiate mm -hmm. between a high tech and a low tech company? So now the question that I have is, is it a high tech company and a low tech company? Or is it high tech industry and low tech industry? I think it's definitely, uh, uh, I mean, a high tech industry if from the sense that there is rapid, uh, you know, enhancement required in the product. Okay. Um, uh, you know, uh, one product doesn't. The product life cycle is is short. Mm -hmm. Now it's it's maybe just a higher version, so more okay. power. Uh, or, let or let more me just speed speak at you. Here. When you say product life cycle is short, fashion industry has the shortest yeah. product life cycle. You know, like it's something like a fad that could happen, a fad cycle, and then suddenly that should be a bloody exciting, uh, high tech industry. Then it's. Yeah, fashion industry is a low-tech industry, uh, okay. but a rapidly changing uh, product cycle. Whereas, mm, you see, uh, the, the okay. reason we also we are also saying that it's, it's high-tech is because if you if we have the benefit of foresight as to what Intel was doing in parallel as we read the case. So, as they were working on DRAM, you know, some engineers were working on what's called the EEPROM technology. Some were even probably discovering the whole microprocessor chip. Uh, so, um, you know, I, I, I don't know. Uh, it's a multiple, uh, rapidly changing product cycles, you know, rapidly reducing cost in the industry. Okay. Uh, so okay. one characteristic of a commodity industry, but uh, can't remove the fact that the one uh, element required in this company was to be on the edge of design uh, around its product uh, its functionality and technology around its product which also you know they claim the case writer claims that intel was eventually a generation behind uh, no r no real reason is given as to why that happened were the japanese just faster the reason is there in the case no benefit, uh, the reason is there in the case japanese the missed there. a very critical point and that's what i'm really wanting you to get Okay, now, uh, before we actually move ahead into that point, there's something very interesting that's happening here. Uh, if I really ask, or I would like to make a comment here and then we'll quickly move ahead. There is nothing like a high-tech, uh, what do you call, industry or a low-tech industry. I think this is the biggest misnomer that we actually have. Uh, all industries, for that matter, could actually be high-tech and all industries could be low-tech. Uh, it is always a high-tech company or a low-tech company. Because the way the company operates, the way the company differentiates its products, the way it manufactures, the way it designs, or the way it actually creates value of its, from its products. A very simple example, if you really talk about the Israelis and the world, uh, Israel has the finest agriculture, uh, what I call equipment manufacturing setup. But a lot of us would say that agriculture is low tech. No, it's not. Agriculture could be as high tech as it actually gets. Because if you really look at the productivity numbers, that productivity numbers come through that high tech uh, or high technology usage or very smart technology usage. Uh, similarly, if you really talk about, say, something like perfumes, how do you say that perfumes made out of, say, Agra in India, which we call as Ittar, 
would sell at about 100 the price of a perfume which is actually getting sold out of uh, uh, say France. Why do you think that actually happens? So if you really look at it, you could actually create value around anything. So there is nothing like a high tech industry or a low tech industry. It's always a high tech company or a low tech company. In fact, in this case, if you really look at it, uh, a lot of us would actually make a mistake of saying that when we actually talk about a company which, which is into computers, is necessarily a high tech company. If I actually start an email service today, do you think I become a high tech company? Because email can be started so easily. I'm not a high tech company at all. In fact, for you, for me, in fact, we can have our own server and we could actually start an email service. And there is no differentiation at all. So it becomes a very low tech thing today. When it started, yes, it was a high tech or it was a very smart solution that came across, but not as of today. So if you, if you really look at this whole idea, uh, well, what's happening is that Intel was actually a low tech player at that time. It was actually getting into a commodity business. And now if, if you really look at it, they were actually not getting the customer right. How do you think they were not getting the customer right? Because this is one of the main points of why, do you, why, why Intel actually failed. Intel, okay, now let me ask you, what was Intel focusing on when they were actually looking at doing some kind of innovation on their chips or on their, uh, what do you call as, uh, memories? And what do you think was the focus of the Japanese players? Uh, well, Intel, as it appears, was, as they were uh, developing their product, Intel was focusing on iterations to get their design right uh, or, you know, in the sense that moving from if I look at the, I probably understand the product graph, they're probably trying to go from 1K to 4K. So they're trying to make their product incrementally better. Okay. Uh, that's, you know, in a strategic way, if I can say. Okay. Um, well, now, Japanese, one is that, you know, the few, the, the key competitors that Intel had, Japanese, they were themselves making the equipments also, some of them. They were vertically integrated, like Hitachi or, or Mitsubishi. And, uh, um, you know, I don't know how they could have got the customer right better where, you know, uh, okay. uh, let, let me give Intel you a hint. should have. Okay. So mm -hmm. If you, if you really look at this uh, whole thing. Okay. Now, uh, let me ask Patavi Raman on this and then I'll uh, get back to you. Then I'll actually drop sure. an answer on this. Uh, yes, uh, Patavi Raman. What do you think was Intel doing wrong? Uh, I think at that at that point at that point of time they were uh, still a, probably about a couple of years behind the hello am I, am I clear am I yeah yeah please please go ahead yeah 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 okay I think at that time they were still trying to notch up uh, with the Japanese learning curve who had a far better learning curve in the sense that uh, Intel by then were still at uh, trying to get into the 16 uh, K DRAM generation rather than getting into a 64 K uh, which the uh, Japanese were already in. Okay. So I think. Uh, Why do you think this was happening? Was Why do you think this was happening? Okay, let, let me actually give you an answer here. Probably, probably, probably. Yeah. 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 If if you really look at Intel, at some somewhere in the history or somewhere in the past, what Intel did was that Intel said, "We are actually going to make chip, uh, memories which are going to be using less and less power." Right, and whereas the Japanese were saying that we are going to make memories which are going to be bigger in size, and suddenly, if you really look at it, the customer was not really looking at more efficient uh, or uh, memories which were using less power at that point in time. And Intel was focusing on this, and Intel started losing the battle there. And the second thing that was actually happening was that the Japanese were saying we are going to make bigger and bigger chips. If you really look at the graph that is given, it moved from 1K to 4 to 16 to 64 to 128 to 256, it was actually moving ahead very, very quickly. And the, these guys were focusing on the wrong sets of things. They understood the market in the wrong way somewhere. Because if you really look at it, this takes us to a very critical point. And that is, when you are trying to innovate, like you need to understand the pulse of the market as well. What is the, what is it, what is the category motivation? Because this company did not really understand the category motivation somewhere. Why, why customers are really going to buy my chip? Is it that they are looking at a higher memories or is it that they are looking at, say, more power efficient things? In fact, at that point in time, when you, when you talk about the 60s or the 70s, power was not an issue. Being green was not an issue at all. Being green is an issue today. So they were probably way ahead of time in terms of even looking at that power issue. 
and that is where they started losing something. But anyways, like I think we'll get a little better set of answers if we actually look at why do you think company like Intel was so successful in microprocessors? What do you think they actually did to be successful in microprocessors? Yes, Patabi Raman. <laughs> I think I've lost that. Why do you think Intel was successful in microprocessors? Uh, I think pri uh, the primary primary thing the, primary, the um, uh, Intel as a microprocessor company they were pretty good uh, because most of the uh, uh, daily uses like your uh, most of the components which are used in uh, industrial controls or in in terms of your uh, you know, uh, calculators and the things. I think most of it had the microprocessors and uh, these guys had actually secured uh, the uh, 8088 uh, uh, microprocessor with the, you know, um, uh, into the uh, IBM PCs. And I think they tried to market and they also tried to gain a greater advantage by uh, marketing their, um, you know, Intel Inside campaign. I think uh, uh, that was a greater success uh, which I could find uh, from this case. I think PC was a big market and I think microprocessors, microcomputers were in and microprocessors were needed inside it and I think they did a decent job in terms of uh, you know, uh, marketing themselves within within the uh, PC which itself was an exploding business then. I think that is what my understanding was. Okay, great. Uh, so if you really look at it, what you're saying is that they actually started uh, by uh, f focusing on uh, what do you call uh, creating some kind of a standard, right? That am I right in saying that? True. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so if you if, w w what you see here is like if you really look at it, there's something like a clear cut pasture that actually developed over a period of time. What were the other things? One was a standard thing that you're really saying. Any other thing that comes to your mind? Why do you think they were successful? How they actually unfolded the success? What were the steps that they actually took up? And if I really want to learn from this, how do you think I can learn from this as a company? Uh, probably it was more in terms of um, uh, the, uh, the, the, should I say perfect or high energy marketing which they did. Uh, probably that is key. And of course the sales effort. I, I see only high end sales and marketing effort being channelized there. Of course they got the product right. So I guess. Okay, so one, one is a marketing bit. Okay, uh, I, I'll get back to you on uh, this, Patabi Raman. Uh, yes, uh, we, we have Sur uh, Siddharth from Lucknow. Yes, Siddharth. Okay, uh, I think we've just lost uh, Siddharth, so uh, we will ask Poorna here. Yes, Poorna. Am I audible? Yes, yes, Poorna. Go ahead. I think uh, they've executed their action plans very well. Okay. And uh, they've updated their company's vision according to market requirements. Okay, well, when you say executed their market plans very well, uh, what do you mean by that? Uh, uh, for example, uh, they have lost uh, their business in DRAM. Uh, their revenue is very less. At that time, they have uh, catched up with the uh, microprocessor business. And they have uh, uh, many design wins by improving uh, more generations in microprocessors. Okay. Mm -hmm. Anything yeah. else that, that comes to your mind? No. Oh, okay. Um, I, I'll get back to you, Poona, on this. Uh, yes, uh, we, we have uh, Sandeep from uh, Bangalore. Yes, Sandeep. Okay. okay. Am I audible? Yes, yes, Sandeep. Go ahead. Hello. A yeah, couple yeah. of things, uh, in addition to the setting up standard, one is uh, they were able to launch uh, higher speed microprocessors at a pretty high speed. Uh, for instance, when uh, they came up with this Red X uh, campaign, at that time AMD has a 286 processor and uh, they were able to show that uh, 
386 processor is available at the same price and um, they could do it uh, continuously uh, till uh, uh, AMD actually launched uh, one uh, processor later on uh, which was quite late but till then they were able to come up with uh, a high speed processor at a pretty fast speed the other one was that they were able to protect their intellectual uh, property rights Beautiful. something okay. which was not uh, something which was not there in case of uh, DRAM um, in case of uh, DRAM uh, as well as microprocessor there was some cross licensing which was there but there was something called a micro code which could which was uh, copyrighted and uh, they were a, they were able to um, get the protection for that so that was something which was very important mm -hmm. and uh, then they could uh, one of the marketing strategy which they did uh, was putting the Intel inside uh, sticker on uh, all the uh, OEMs and uh, where they supported the marketing uh, effort up to 50% uh, uh, for the OEMs also provided that uh, Intel Inside sticker goes with that. So that means that all the PCs which were launched at that time especially uh, from smaller OEMs um, they will use uh, Intel inside their uh, computers. So that was one thing which they did. Okay, so uh, th this is where we'll actually build it up. So we, we, we are going to, towards a very interesting answer here. So if you really look at what Intel did, uh, so what, what Intel did was that it did something remarkable to begin with uh, when they actually went into microprocessors, and that was that they actually wanted to create a standard here. And this was about the battle of standards. If you really look at the electronics industry, uh, or typically if you really look at technology industry per se, uh, the technology industry, the company which controls the standards will always control the profits in the industry. Uh, a very simple case in point, uh, if, if you have something like say uh, Qualcomm, uh, Qualcomm controls the CDMA technology, uh, but then who, they, Qualcomm always gets some money because of that. Because what happens is, so, uh, whenever there is a new customer that goes on to a CDMA network, Reliance has to, or on a Reliance network, they have to give something to Qualcomm. So that means there is a standard that is actually there which is controlled by somebody and you are going to make money on it. Uh, sim if you really look at what happened during the Intel phase that they actually did, that they got, in, got a standard right. In fact, they actually got that standard by creating uh, what do you call barriers through patenting and so on and so forth. It was not a loosely held patent. If you really look at the industry that Intel created with uh, micro, the DRAMs, uh, they did not protect it through patents. At least in the case of microprocessors, they started creating uh, or they started protecting it through patents. That was the first thing that they actually did. The next most important thing that Intel did was that they actually got into that Intel Insight campaign. If you really look at a micro, if you really look at say something like a chip uh, or a microprocessor, how important is a microprocessor for an end consumer to really uh, see? Say so when you when you talk about a microprocessor, uh, Intel said, okay, now we I'm going to connect to the consumer. I am not really going to connect to my customer. Because if you really look at it, the OEM is the customer there and consumer is somebody like you and me. And what, what Intel started doing was that they started connecting with people like you and me. Because that's where they said Intel inside. That's where they said, okay, uh, a microprocessor is something hugely important. And we all started going or moving towards a situation wherein we said, okay, I need a computer which has an Intel. And if you really look at the market today, it's all about that. In fact, there could be a superior technology which is available in the market. Say, like, if you talk about AMD, AMD Turians and everything. In fact, at the, somewhere in the history also, AMD was actually making a few sets of better products, but then Intel was able to dominate the market. I mean, in, in fact, today also Intel controls more than 85% of the market. And how are they able to do it? Because they're able to do it because they... They were able to connect to the consumer and they were able to create in the mind of the consumer that we are exceptionally good. And there was another thing allied with this and that was that they were actually making their own product obsolete before somebody else did. So this is this becomes a very important thing. If, if you really look at at one point in time in history when Intel was actually moving from uh, not part of the case but then something which actually gives us a huge learning that when Intel lost the race to AMD for coming up with core 2 or uh, dual core processors and uh, AMD suddenly spiked in terms of say higher market share and uh, Intel started losing it and that is where they said okay now we have to be the technology pioneers and that is what they are actually doing even today. So in this case what they were doing is that they actually <coughs> they came up with a standard which was something which was controlled by them and of course 
till about 286 it was a freely held or the others were able to copy it but after 386 they said okay we are going to manufacture everything on our own and that's what they actually started doing and then the second thing was that they made it a proprietary standard like because after they said we are going to manufacture it it became a proprietary standard so if you really look at it the third stage was about proprietary stand second stage was about proprietary standards and so there was, there was something else that ha actually happened after this and it was about how do I sustain that value and so so the first thing that they did was they said okay I'm going to create or something called as value creation that they did and in this value creation they, they actually came up with something like uh, a standard a base level standard the second thing was creating a proprietary standard through connecting uh, uh, to the customers directly the Intel inside campaign the second thing that they actually did was <coughs> uh, was in terms of uh, uh, killing the manufacturing process with others because that's the 286 386 time when they said okay we are going to manufacture everything and the third thing that they actually did was about sustaining value and they continued to do this process and that is where they started making money but now if, if you really look at it so this is how the whole industry was actually unfolding in case of microprocessors, the industry was very, or the, in case of microprocessors, Intel did something which was hugely different from what they actually did in uh, DRAMs. What do you think was it? So what, what is the key learning for us in this case? So if, if I ask this, so what, what's the key learning? Okay, now we have Amit uh, who wants to say something. Yes, Amit. I uh, you know. Uh yeah, yeah, like uh, uh, just not to interrupt here. No, uh, just wanted to add here specifically what you wanted about how exactly they maintained uh, that particular value, and uh, uh, it's like now clear like uh, why Intel holds an importance in the market, and this was the turning point. In fact, in 1985, when they decided to be a sole source manufacturer, but uh, why specifically they have been. Uh, uh, into the market or uh, uh, or by being used widely by most of the customers to maintain that thing I think they offered customized product uh, what do we specifically mean about that is like they offer different kind of uh, processors or chips for uh, different types of users L let's say for workstations or servers they have their different variants and they, in they invested heavily in uh, doing R&D for uh, those particular products Let's say if we have a Xeon processor for, uh, uh, you know, for those PCs which uh, have games or uh, high, high graphics installed, or if we have uh, Itanium kind of uh, varieties for servers, so uh, they actually have offered uh, varieties in their uh, products to different kind of uh, servers and uh, or might be high end uh, users or uh, low end users, you know. Uh, at the same time, you know, when AMD launched their uh, uh, product uh, uh, in 19, uh, 1999 or 2000 they have of, uh, launched this 1 gigahertz version at that time they, they offer uh, they offered this Intel Celeron that, that's again high performing for low end customers so they did right marketing at right time and at the same time they offered uh, uh, customized products to their different customers okay great uh, so now so I think uh, yes. fairly good uh, Amit yes uh, if we just try to uh, close this uh, there's something very interesting here uh, between the two sets of industries. One was about standards, proprietary standards. This takes us to a very important business debate uh, about uh, yeah. open source, a very important debate about how, how we can actually create standards uh, across different sets of products, how can companies gain out of it. And then I have a one very simple uh, allied question, which is the most standardized uh, industry in the world? Any ideas on this? No, uh, well, as such, I'm not say, but I can just give an example. Let's say if we talk about Sun Microsystems or Microsoft, uh, Sun Microsystems has a lot many users and uh, developers because their technology is uh, basically open source. But Microsoft has uh, actually standardized their product. You know, no, it's copyrighted basically. Uh, so, uh, but if we specifically talk about Intel, you know, they have uh, uh, they have. Uh, taken this uh, important decision, you know, to outshine their uh, competitor. That's AMD. They knew that if they they keep going ahead with AMD, then uh, certainly at to one stage, you know, uh, it, uh, they will be like equal in competition. But they actually wanted to uh, like to be ahead in the competition and uh, you know uh, to be a, uh, you know someone like 
having some something like very good market share in the industry so okay. uh, uh, interesting amit so like i'll go to anupama then and then go to rajiv and then we'll close the, this case uh, yes uh, anupama anupama yes uh, can you can hear me yeah yeah absolutely yeah well, what do you want me to add now because it's almost everything has been spoken here <laughs> okay now any any points so, okay like let me ask you i really because okay i must ask you a question what is the most standardized industry in the world and then i should ask you an allied question do you think microsoft wants privacy mm yes of course because what happens is at some level piracy is there which helps them uh, create a big customer base what mm. they do is is only when the company becomes big uh, that is where they start asking for licenses as long as let's say i am a company with five uh, users and i use pirated software it's uh, okay with them is only when the company starts growing not is where they are looking at licenses So in some way I would say that they do promote piracy. Okay now I'll give you a different answer to this. If if you really look at it, Microsoft would certainly want piracy because what happens is say they they allowed Microsoft Office to be used across the board by anybody in the world. And now suddenly Microsoft Office has become a de facto standard for office software. And the moment that became a standard, we have got so used to it. I am I am so used to it, you're so used to it. and we can't live without say something like a word or a powerpoint or whatever and now they can charge whether you're a small company or you're a big company i uh, we have to use microsoft software so standard got created over a period of time to this in fact this also leads us to or gives us a very interesting answer why linux has failed because there are 200 300 different versions of linux available in the market and people are not able to understand that there's a there could be a standard around in fact so standards are something which creates so much value for companies across the board and if i'm able to create a standard yes when you talk about the iim system here iims is a standard or whatever so there is always a standard that gets created harvard business school harvard business school is about that de facto educational standard that we are really talking about so standard is something which is very critical for creating value in business and controlling the businesses there uh this is one major issue that comes up in fact like what is the most standardized industry in the world i must ask you that question and of course standards are great for customers remember that standards are great for the customer because the moment products get standardized uh, the competition will always be on price right uh, and but then if you have a proprietary standard then you can get exploited of course uh, but then if you really talk about when you talk about say something like a blue ray uh, there is this whole huge standard battle that is actually being fought right now between blue ray desk and hd desk why were they fighting because you would actually get so much money after that there is a huge uh, uh, money in terms of like anybody who creates a standard or controls the standard would actually get some royalties to it and then there is another thing when you talk about standards that it does not necessarily mean that a better technology will create a standard it could be an inferior technology that could create a standard say when you talk about in uh, a great point or a great it case in, uh, this thing is there, there were two technologies one was uh, pal and the other one was beta max Beta Max was a far superior technology to VHS. Sorry, VHS technology, the, the big cassettes that we actually used to use at one time. And uh, but then Beta Max just failed because VHS ended up becoming a standard somewhere in the world. So that is where uh, what do you call somebody made tons and tons of money. But now if you really talk about standards, wherein prices have gone to the lowest possible ebb in the world, what do you think? And in fact, what I want to say is the most standardized is you could actually buy the product from anywhere in the world. You could still use it. you could buy any component in any part of the world out of 160 countries in the world and still it could fit into that product in your country and it still work what is that product yes make a wild guess it's not education so if you think it was education then it's not okay let, let me ask rajiv when we close the discussion with him uh Yes, uh, <coughs> Rajiv. Yeah, um, it, uh, uh, you know, uh, I can, uh, Rajiv, I can hear you. Excellent. Can you hear me now? Yeah. 
Okay. So the the discussion on creation of that standard on Microsoft was excellent. And I think that's what Intel also did, which is they, uh, you know, as mentioned in the section of complementers, not just working with IBM as a customer, but also working with the final person who writes the OS, Microsoft, so that, you know, the, the so-called famous Microsoft Intel cartelization, which is, you know, they pretty much controlled uh, uh, everything around uh, this industry from the microprocessor to the, to the applications. And then... Uh, what also comes out interesting is, you know, what Intel started realizing if it has to continuously be ahead and kill its own product, it will need the softwares to run on higher end uh, uh, processing speeds, etc. So mm -hmm. working with other software vendors and launching all this Intel capital, which we believe is something that Google does these days also, which is, uh, you know, launches a Google capital type of stuff and seeds technologies or people to do stuff which Google could leverage. Mm -hmm. So that's on that, you know, that's on the Great. Intel case. I, I would definitely want, you know, one question to be answered, which sure. is, uh, you know, from you, which is, you know, how the case ends, uh, which is, you know, now they're moving to the Internet era, their resources are too thin, they want to do everything. So, you know, your point of view on the challenges that the, uh, you know, the Barrett era faces, I mean, have they realized now that, you know, sticking with just the microprocessor and the advancement there is not going to keep giving up, giving them the, uh, uh, you know, the increase in profits or market capitalization, which was the best just pre-2001. So just, you know, comment on that. And now coming to your question of, uh, what was your question, what's the most standard product in the world? Yeah, you could buy it from anywhere in the world, it still works in your company. Or company. Egg. No. <laughs> yeah, I think it would... <laughs> it's not a commodity. Okay, it was a, it was a more, okay, it was yeah. a business question. Yes. Well, it's, I mean, uh, sticking on Microsoft, it's the office automation software. No, no, no. It's a product that we actually no. ride okay. on. Okay, most. Oh, you product you ride on. Okay, I'll what? give you a hint. The, the post-it. Okay, the post-it. No, no, uh, no, 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 not, here, not write on, no. not write on, yeah. ride on. Ride, ride on, on, ride on. Yeah. It's uh, the most standard product would be the bi I don't know the bicycle. Then you know you could exactly bicycle ride on is it the anywhere. most bicycle is the most standardized product in the world today. You that is why yeah. the prices have gone down to such an extent. You are able to buy a bicycle in China for about three hundred to four hundred rupees. Right. So the the whole thing is if you if you have a gear called Shimano, I'm sure you've heard of a company called Shimano. You could actually pick up those gear mm -hmm. set or whatever and it would fit into your 24 inch cycle or it would actually go into any cycle in the world. You could actually get Garari's for your web cycle from anywhere in the world and it would fit into this. So in fact, bicycle has become the most standardized product. But incidentally, when you talk about standard, that's something great to happen. In US, even the size of the door is standardized. That is how they've been able to bring down the prices. Yes. And okay, now answering your question. Uh, if you really look at what, what Intel is doing, that Intel has somehow understood that it, it has to move towards being a more service-oriented company. Intel is not only about, uh, what do you call, a microprocessor company now. They're really redefining themselves as a more service-oriented company somewhere. Uh, because that's where they feel that that, that mm -hmm. is where they're actually going to get value. In fact, that's a transition that IBM has done. From being a computer industry to being one of the most smart, uh, what do you call, uh, uh, service companies in the computer industry and that's a similar journey that Intel is wanting to do because when you talk about products yes they, they control the standard they are the standard but still they have to find something better for themselves they have to find ways to grow because any firm has to go over a period of time they would have aspirations for that and that is what they are actually doing now sure so we are actually going to discuss more about Intel somewhere down the line in the course with more sets of information and some okay. more interspersed examples but just as a uh, side uh, thing on this if all of you can read a book called Only the Paranoid Survive, uh, it's a very interesting book if you could just put, pick it up. I think it is one of the best books uh, uh, that you can actually find on the uh, on business. Paranoid Survive. It's a book by Andy Grove. Andy Grove used to be the CEO for Intel. And uh, this book, book is published, I think, by Viva in India, and it's just about 200 rupees or whatever. So I think each one of you could actually just pick it up. But it's an excellent read, and I, I think you should take out time to read this. 
So this is what we really wanted to do on the Intel case. Let's have a break for about 15 minutes. We'll come back and then uh, we'll go on to the next uh, pasture for the session. Thank you. I, uh, so we're going to restart the session. Um, we have the next case that we have to really uh, discuss today and that's the US airline uh, industry case. And uh, in this case I would actually uh, conduct the session in a little different uh, way because uh, I will not go for a full-fledged discussion of the case as we did for Intel or uh, one of the other cases that was uh, the US growing industry case. Uh, in this case I would like to uh, hear your comments on what do you think about the industry. Very simple set of comments for one minute and what do you think is happening in the Indian airline industry. I want you to actually draw some comparisons uh, between the Indian airline industry and this industry and what do you think are the issues and uh, not more than two minutes for each one of you and I'll actually go to each one of you to really get these comments and then I'll actually give you my analysis for the situation and I'll typically close the analysis with uh, uh, what I think about the Indian uh, airline industry. Uh, in fact, just to uh, give you a brief on the Indian airline industry, if you really look at it, uh, uh, Indian airline industry was uh, something which, which has got punctuated by about two or three distinct phases. And uh, there were a few companies who have done something exceptional during these phases. One of them is, uh, or if I really say the first thing that happened was uh, done by somebody called Air Sahara, now a defunct airline which actually was picked up by Jet Air and so on and so forth. Uh, but Air Sahara did something interesting and that was called as the Apex Fairs. Uh, so I, I would really under, want to understand what, what is this Apex Fair issue all about and what do you think they were doing, what, what do you think they were thinking at that point in time. And then after that there, there was uh, one very interesting player called uh, Air Deccan which actually came into existence and Air Deccan did something fantastic in terms of uh, uh, looking at the market segment, looking at pricing in a different way. And then of course at the Air Deck, if Air Deccan was on one side of the spectrum, the, on the other side of the spectrum was somebody called as Kingfisher. And uh, they did something uh, extravagant in terms of uh, the quality of service to the kind of, uh, uh, what do you call, the, 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 the way they were interacting with the customer. So it, it was that whole huge quality paradigm that they really redefined in this uh, industry, at least in the Indian context. So, uh, w w w so uh, my questions would be, how do you think you can actually answer these three things? Why do you think? Uh, Air Sahara did Apex Fairs, what, what do you think was Air Deccan doing, what do you think Kingfisher was doing, uh, why do you think Indian Airlines was not doing well, what about the inefficiencies in the system, what are the challenges that the Indian Airlines uh, industry faces. In fact, if you really look at it, uh, there is a huge thing that happened in the last 10 days. Uh, in fact, uh, the airline industry threatened a strike in India uh, on August 18th and it has been called up. Uh, but I, I think uh, the industry is probably facing similar sets of problems. Uh, as uh, what the US industry has been facing for some time. In fact, one of the most competitive industries uh, in the world is probably the US airline industry. Uh, say for a five hour flight from New York to say San Francisco, uh, one coast to the other coast, uh, would, for a return ticket you could actually get a return ticket for as low as about $110. So on an exchange rate you could talk about say 5,000 rupees for a return ticket, which is exceptional. So what, what do you think is happening here? And, what, what do you think are the critical points for a business model here? And if you if you start really looking at as a as a strategic uh, from a strategic perspective, how do you think companies make money in this? And why are they really making a few sets of decisions? Uh, why are they really competing on price and so on and so forth? So uh, these are a few questions. So I would actually start uh, uh, from the top, and uh, then and then I'd like to hear views from each one of you. About two minutes from each one of you, uh, probably one and a half to two minutes and then we will actually go for uh, my sets of comments on this. Uh, okay, Sandeep, uh, we would uh, start with you here. Uh, what do you think is this industry all about? Uh, the industry basically uh, was regulated initially in uh, US and uh, once they saw that uh, uh, 
there is place for more uh, uh, players and uh, the competition will uh, be consumer friendly they introduced a lot of uh, they gave permission for uh, others also and uh, at that case at that time the barriers to entry and exit uh, both were low as a result many new and small players uh, came into picture uh, because of which the the competition intensified and uh, that led to a lot of uh, innovations in uh, like pricing and uh, uh, removal of uh, the middlemen for the uh, commission and uh, uh, then uh, programs like frequent flyer and most of the things uh, uh, were something which could be copied by anybody else also and uh, that caused a problem as a result there were a lot of mergers and uh, acquisitions which happened in this industry towards the end. So what you're saying is there was a huge and level of strategy convergence that was happening within the industry. Everybody was trying to do the same set of things. Yeah. Yes, yes. That's okay. what has happened. For instance, uh, uh, should, uh, for instance, things like uh, frequent flyers when they were introduced, uh, they thought that uh, they will get some loyalty through this. But uh, then later it was found that uh, every free, every person who who was in that category was frequent flyer in uh, more than one uh, uh, airlines. So things like uh, that were there, and uh, then uh, the pricing. Uh, initially, they came up with the concept of uh, low pricing or uh, innovation pricing, where uh, if you book a few days in advance, then you get special discounts or things like that. But then uh, that thing also could be copied uh, by everybody else, and uh, in the end, it, they were uh, fighting on the price and uh, not on okay. anything else. Um, then there were uh, some. Yeah, go ahead, please. Okay. The yeah, then there were some uh, specialized uh, uh, airlines which uh, targeted a particular segment. Uh, Southwest was uh, one of them, and which had a very fast turnaround time, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, they could uh, they could because they didn't offer uh, many th like the quality and uh, food and all the other things. They were able to generate a lot of business, but uh, this also led to many uh, other. Uh, uh, bigger airlines to try to use this uh, approach in which they failed. Okay, so uh, anything that you can actually tell about the Indian airline industry, any sets of comments in terms of like why do you think there was a there were apex fares and why do you think the industry bleeds to such a great extent? Uh, why do you think it seems that nobody in the airline industry would ever make money and there is always an issue in this industry and. Uh, uh, is it that it's it's a business approach or is it the business the basic uh, business that they are in that that's wrong or whatever? Uh, one of the things is that there are too many players. Uh, slowly, when people see that uh, the entry barriers are very low, then uh, too many players come into picture, and uh, most of them have uh, almost same model. Uh, Air Sahara, when they launched the uh, Apex Fair, they thought that uh, by dividing the customers into different groups, they will be able to. Uh, get more people, but then other other uh, airlines also uh, copied that. Uh, when Air Deccan launched low price uh, initially, uh, it was uh, the flights were between a few uh, airports where the traffic was not very high. But slowly they expanded, and uh, then the problems uh, started coming. Like uh, they will not get uh, 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 place to park the plane, or there will be a delay in landing which uh, had an effect on uh, uh, the turnaround time mm -hmm. so that was another thing which uh, happened and uh, then kingfisher they wanted to get to a different class but they also wanted to charge low prices okay. so they, they the strategy was a little uh, it was a little confused uh, thing i mean uh, either uh, you get to the higher end customer or you get to the lower end customer they wanted to do both so that was the problem with the kingfisher okay uh, interesting sets of points and the uh, great to start the uh, uh, what discussion on this. So le let's see what others have to say on this. Uh, Suresh, mm. hello. Yes, Suresh. Yeah. Uh, uh, just uh, build up on the ideas on the that uh, uh, Sandeep has given. So do, don't repeat the points. Just build up on those points. Uh, why? Why do you think yeah. the industry is not doing well? What are the problems and so on and so forth? Some some of the common uh, observations about what the U.S. airline and Indian airline industry is currently facing, and picking on some of the common issues are uh, uh, the innovations. I think there is some some saturation even to what the innovations that uh, both the airlines are currently doing. 
and whatever mm -hmm. innovations they have done uh, right from the earlier stage till date are easily copied or implemented uh, in a very short span of time. So the customer uh, will, I mean, has many choices and probably might might lead uh, uh, it might lead to uh, you know a decision making by the customer. I mean, what to go for? So a customer has multiple choices to go for rather than. Uh, a key differentiator that any airline can offer. Okay. Uh, and uh, any any of these kind of uh, things will saturate even the market too because it's all value add service but not really affecting the cost. So uh, the 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 revenues of all these airlines would kind of you know get staggered or, or mm -hmm. uh, uh, hit a hit a dead end. And uh, because of which uh, saturation in the innovation or value added service uh, will uh, drive for consolidations. And uh, that's where consolidations, like many of the earlier uh, airlines, I mean, there's mergers of uh, airlines, both in the Indian and US airlines, we have seen uh, over a period of time. Okay. And uh, that's again, uh, that, 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 that's, uh, that's another common observation that uh, we can see both in the Indian and the uh, US airlines. Uh, and one, one taking one uh, takeaway from the previous thing, it's, it's uh, again, uh, uh, we can categorize that as a low tech industry. Uh, mm -hmm. And because of which the other, I mean, whatever, uh, not much of a key differentiator that we have seen, and pretty much standardized in terms of uh, uh, any 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 uh, feature or uh, any uh, service that you do as are pretty much standardized. There would not be a unique standard created by any vendor uh, mm -hmm. in this industry. Uh, that's okay. Great, 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 Suresh. Okay, so let, let, let's uh, uh, talk to uh, uh, Murali from uh, Chennai. So yes, uh, Murali. Uh, yeah. uh, see a couple of points. One of the first, uh, welcome back. Uh, first, Simlati welcome back. Between. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> no, but I've been there for a long time. I'm not visible. So. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> yes, Murali. So uh, starting with. Uh, See, one big similarity between both industries is that uh, goes through a phase of regulation, deregulation, mm -hmm. and regulation, where the government seems to be an instrumental part in uh, bailing out this industry every now and then. I think that's a big similarity between both Indian industry and the American airline industry. So once the first deregulation, I think everybody adopted a hit and run strategy. They just bothered about short term goals, making quick money, increasing the load factor alone. And uh, they've really not looked at uh, stretching the RPM, which uh, they mentioned, yeah. the revenue per passenger mile. So that was not focused upon. Uh, so coming back to this uh, particular phase where they are again looking for an intention for the government, because I think they've kind of run out with uh, all options. And everybody, if you look at the index there, it shows that uh, the cost has gone up for everybody in the last four years. Uh, the yield has come down, uh, so there seems to be some kind of an issue where the capacity utilization or, op or uh, optimized capacity utilization is an issue and uh, uh, there are no strategies for stretching the revenue per passenger mile and cash flow which seems to be one of the issues okay. because um, you know there is no middleman, there is no money moving in and things like that. So these are some of the issues which they face. Okay. And if, if this industry, uh, yes, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Okay. First, you complete your point. Then I'll ask you a question. See, if you look at, if you look at uh, a parallel, you know, I like to talk about this company called Air Asia, which operates based out of Malaysia. Yeah. I think they're one of the low-cost airlines, which is the highest profit-making airlines in the world today, and they charge somewhere around 250 ringgits from. <laughs> Uh, Kuala Lumpur to Bangkok, which is for 3,500 rupees. No, the worst is that and you can so actually, actually fly to Australia on this airline for less than 15,000 rupees from India. That's right. So I think they have now launched Trichy service, Kuala Lumpur to Trichy at 1,046 rupees, which is mind blowing. But I believe they do a few things which probably what Deccan missed or Sahara missed or even Jetlight is probably not doing. As they look at incremental price for services. Uh, you want a uh, seat preference, you got to pay additional, you got a meal, you got to pay extra, you got to use a loo inside the slide, you got to pay extra. And uh, they use ground efficiency, ground level efficiency is very high because they don't have too many people 
you know, waving for the flight to land and towing them down and things. So they just have two people to manage an aircraft in a landing station and in a rebounding station. Uh, similarly, uh, unloading and rebounding, they also have a fixed time train of 15 minutes, which probably Southwest also has in the U.S. market. Uh, then there's, uh, they typically talk no fill, uh, which I think is kind of giving, even the pilot has to pay money for his food. Yeah. I think they've stuck to a model and I think it's working and they're just pursuing on that. The rest, I think, they started uh, becoming greedy. They probably wanted to compete with everybody else. So I think they kind of lost the strategy with which they existed initially. I think that was one of the reasons. The other things which probably happened here also is the mergers and acquisitions. Uh, like Sahara was bought over by Jet. Um, the Deccan was bought over by Kingfisher. I think government intervention should not have been there when Jet and Kingfisher got into a discussion. I think they should have allowed them to go ahead with optimizing some of the ground efficiency, which could have probably helped them survive. Mm -hmm. The third was the Apex Fair. The Apex Fair, which uh, Sahara launched, and then which even Indian Airlines got into. The problem happened with the Apex Fair is, I don't know, the objective was to entice the business traveler, or is it a heavy traveler with the, you know, or a holy a leisure kind of travel. So it finally ended up everybody buying an Apex ticket. Even I hold tickets even now. Uh, and I pay only 1,000 rupees extra whenever I just revalidate the ticket. So I actually fly Delhi Chennai for 3,000, 4,000 chips. Okay. So I think obviously you're going to lose money because you've passed the deadline. But because yeah, the everything ticket, happened around discount. Tickets, yeah. So I think uh, the strategies were purely basis economies of scale. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think um, the economies of scale alone is what it works. That's why they said the contestability factor uh, may not be the solution, though it offers, uh, it, it's still contestable, but it's not. Mm -hmm. Probably, you know, uh, the economies of scale is not the only thing which the airline should use. I think they should go beyond. I say if, even if you look at the case, the only four airlines survived. From yeah. 1938 to uh, 1995, I think this four airlines survived. Why and does this... Okay, now now the start. question is, why does this happen all the while? Is it that everybody who gets into this industry who is a bloody stupid idiot or whatever, all the CEOs are dumb? Or there is something else that is happening... Yeah, so no, as it said, I think the NC barriers are pretty uh, no. less. You can hire a flight, you can take a leave, you can rent a space, you can take pilots for, uh, you know, the grounded pilots, you can hire them. So there is no major regulation in terms of how, how much life is for a flight. Now, if you look at this case, uh, Boeing was sold uh, a 4 million, uh, 4, 4 million, uh, 450 million flight was sold at 4 million to another airline after 20 years and they also operate. Now, there is no regulations on these parameters, but instead only tax and these kind of regulations which happen. Yeah. So I okay. think there has to be some kind of parameters which needs to be looked at in this industry wherein there is some level playing field which is given and not just shifting blocks so that everybody runs at an equal pace. Great. Uh, so, Murli, we'll move ahead and uh, we're very interesting sets of points, very powerful. Uh, and I'm sure, like, uh, let, let's see how... Uh, uh, Patabi Raman uh, actually uh, builds on this one. It actually uh, probably wanted to say more or less similar things to what uh, Murli had already said. I think it's covered quite a lot of things. Is what I uh, okay. What let I me ask you a very simple question then. And acquisition. I think that was okay. 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 Yeah. You you finish your point on mergers and acquisitions. Then I have a question for you. Yeah, I think uh, the only uh, sensible thing probably uh, got went, uh, which went right in India, I guess, was the acquisition, which, you know, there's some sort of a consolidation angle which was seen with uh, Air Deccan being taken uh, taken over with the Kingfisher and things alike. I think they were trying to consolidate and trying to uh, play a pretty level playing field. But for the, um, you know, probably by doing that, somewhere uh, the, the S curve effect probably has come in back, probably the the higher now they got more more uh, aircraft capacity probably more number of people could be flown but uh, having said that i think the uh, the no be no not much of, uh, of an uh, uh, thing build up in terms of you know, uh, to build the traffic probably the marketing efforts were pretty uh, 
were not at all strategic. It was very time bound, very specific, but not very, uh, no, it was just so very floating. Probably that was leaving away a lot of gap to, um, and there was something which is called as the consumer uh, preference, probably somewhere that, that entire thing drifted. And uh, the I, I, I see again the S kind of a curve getting uh, no, uh, reflected, higher aircraft efficiencies with low uh, marking traffic or things alike. So I think probably that is where things went around and uh, uh, the, uh, the, the point also which you're missing is there are four uh, things which one needs to also look at it is one is in terms of the manpower, type of manpower we have in the uh, industry for example, you know uh, probably in terms of that's what is called as labor out here probably the type of aircraft which have been used, the equipment per se what is referred in the case and of course the uh, um, the route rash rationalization could have been probably better. I, I guess people could have been you know, uh, building certain traffic or specialized in carrying a set of uh, uh, thing to a certain, you know, uh, a particular route probably and uh, could have um, done well, uh, done, you know, uh, it could um, probably could have done better with uh, a smaller airlines and the bigger airlines, some sort of a uh, route rationalization possibly could have uh, done better and also talked of um, uh, uh, buying, it's not, not going in directly for buying aircraft, possibly looking at uh, repayment options of, uh, you know, okay. from buying from Boeing and things like much better, buy better crafts, but at a fairly large space, mean, you need not necessarily own the aircraft, probably uh, something on those lines. Great, uh, great, great, uh, Patabi Raman. So, like, uh, we will move ahead and uh, see uh, what uh, Visu has to uh, uh, tell about this. Uh, yes, Visu. Yeah. <coughs> Compared to U.S. Uh, airlines, like uh, the Indian airlines didn't have the regulation first and uh, basically if you look at that hub and spoke system, what the U.S. airlines followed, it was not here in uh, Indian airlines and moreover, it's earlier it was kind of push system, uh, customer didn't have much choices, so now there is a pull system, the customer can be able to choose whatever uh, airlines they want to take it. Okay. Major very nice. Very, 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 very interesting. But anyways, like what do you think would be the core issue uh, that leads us to these kind of problems? Of like the, the low profitability in the airline. Where does it start? Where does it start? Maybe the revenue and the, what the expenses they are doing, it's not giving the much income to them. Okay, okay. So, th there is one point here. I'll get back to you on this uh, later uh, and uh, let's see. L let's move to uh, uh, Anoop from uh, Gurgaon. Uh, yes, Anoop. Yeah, hi. Uh, um, when I read this, the first question that came to my mind was obviously uh, how, to, how to essentially survive in this industry. Uh -huh. Be it the U.S. industry, be it, be it in the India, the airline industry is doing badly. So, uh, and and after reading this, I've realized that over for the last many many years, there's been a lot of crescent troughs. So there there were phases when they were doing not so well, then phases when they did yeah. some of the airlines did well, and then went down again. So there are certain probably intrinsic factors now within the airline industry, and certain external factors which are influencing these trends. So mm -hmm. uh, it would be interesting to get into those and see how the industry itself can overcome some of these factors. Uh, could, could you just uh, give give some some solutions here or uh, whatever? Well, what do you think are those crests and troughs? Mm -hmm. What are driving those crests and troughs? Or what do you call as the cycles in business? What do you think are those? What is it that so, is driving these cycles? Right. So I was looking at the different players uh, influencing the industry. One, of course, was the government uh, 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 that plays a huge role in this to the uh, industry players itself uh, who operate in the industry, uh, three, the customers. Uh, so essentially when I'm looking at, a, at the garment, uh, the regulations and the deregularizing at a particular point in time and then having certain regulations on certain aspects of the industry uh, operations, things like that. I'm really not able to understand, like in certain, uh, certain industries, the garment stand is far more clearly visible uh, but this is what the government is trying to do with its presence uh -huh. that its regulation is intended to do a certain uh, uh, to serve a certain objective 
but in this case especially in the US uh, airline industry many a times uh, it was uh, more to remedy a damage already done rather than uh, be clear in its focus on okay this is why we are here this is how we are going to work together with the industry okay that, that uh, was my understanding fair fair uh, so let, let's move ahead and let's see what uh, uh, Siddharth has to say on this yes Siddharth Siddharth. Yes, Siddharth. Mm, sorry, Siddharth, I can't hear you. Am I audible? Yes, now you are. Yes. Okay. So uh, basically, it seems that Indica is trying to serve in, like all the airlines. There's, there's no uh, major differentiation among the airlines. For example, if I have one route from Lucknow to Delhi, uh, the only uh, the parameter on which I would choose a flight is the time of the day and uh, the, the price. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, like the, basically, in the airline. That's like most of the uh, costs of the airlines are largely fixed, and I think there's a lot like aviation fuel, airport airport costs, booking and traveling agents, commissions to them, and, uh, and essentially the aircraft are also the same. So again, no differentiation there. It's either the airports or a Boeing. And uh, if you take the example of Deccan, they were on a model of uh, Southwest Airlines. And now they suddenly had differentiated and they were targeting a certain segment. But now Deccan has been taken over by Kingfisher Red and it's just like it's been renamed by Kingfisher Red. And now again it seems that it's losing its identity as a low cost uh, airline and uh, it's, it's, it's again seen as if they, uh, they it's, it's got the, the, sh the, uh, the, 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 like the tag name of Kingfisher on it. So it seems as if. Uh, Again, it seems it wants to serve everyone. So, like, basically, there is no major differentiation among the various airlines. And uh, even if, uh, like, like uh, one of my friends mentioned that there was a time that it seems as if all the airlines are losing money, then, then there's a period when they start making money. So that's probably when they come up with new innovation, maybe like the, the, the CRS system or something they can come up with. But again, that is being copied by everyone. So like the, the it is innovation, they make some money, but the innovation is stopped. Again, there's no major differentiation over a period of time, which is probably why uh, it misses the this is a price base. But like every airline is trying to undercut the other, and uh, the government is trying to regulate because the government doesn't want a monopoly. They don't want a cartel among the airlines. So uh, like okay, great. Okay, okay, Siddharth, thanks. Uh, so let's see. Uh, Purna, yes, Purna. Uh, why, why do you think all this is happening? What's the base reason? Actually, almost uh, all of them are having same kind of uh, strategies. Okay. And uh, uh, why do you think they, they have, have okay. much implemented uh, in? The question is, why do you think all of them have similar strategies? One, uh, why is it that everybody is competing on price or whatever? Why, why is it that we are not able to differentiate the service? What's the starting point here? And when you talk about, say, entry barriers uh, being so low here, why do you think the exit barriers are so high? Once somebody enters, he continues to be there, he continues to bleed and everything, and but hardly any people exit. If they exit, it's probably through some consolidation or whatever, but they have led to a greatest possible extent. In well, like say recently in India, uh, I think it was uh, the Goyer uh, guy uh, who's actually said it was his biggest mistake to get into airlines. So, what do you think is actually happening? Actually, these airlines are operated uh, according to market trends. For example, if 
there is any recession impact of that is more on the customers uh, it implies uh, there is more impact on revenues of the airlines i think okay okay puna uh, that's one of the factors mm -hmm. okay so let's let's move ahead and let's see what uh, uh, siddharth has to say about uh, this yes siddharth Uh, sir, resources are which are available right now, sir. Uh, sometimes it depends on the location also, uh, because for the nuclear resources, uh, the uh, being uh, taking as a resource which is being required as a specific resource, it is being also required to note it down whether it is being disposed or whether it is being going used for a constructive purpose or destructive purpose. So there are various facets for resources also. So one okay. facet which is very uh, uh, not uh, prominent in uh, most of the cases, but there. Uh, mane recyclable or uh, disposable disposable part of that solid waste or okay so you're saying there is something to do with resources that are being used here resources that are being used here yes, oh, oh okay very interesting siddharth I, i think this is where uh, we'll actually build up an answer to this thing uh, okay uh, we we have uh, last few points uh, here i think uh, we we'll ask uh, meena here yes yes meena any any points very quickly half a minute uh i think uh, most of my points have already been uh, covered by everybody everybody else in the uh, when people spoke so i i have nothing uh, more okay, to say okay, i think okay. i do agree but i uh, there is i the pricing wars are really killing the business i think so there the margins are low hello but why there is uh, um, i mean i have no answer for okay, that okay perfect I, so why there is no other difference <laughs> Okay uh, so what I'll do now is I'll just show you a very quick uh, presentation here on something called commitment and flexibility now uh, if if you really look at uh, and then we'll come back to this case and uh, we'll try to find a few answers for ourselves <coughs> mm. so if you really look at uh, this whole huge idea there is something called as resources that we use within the organization and they could be say flexible specific resources and very simply put so when you took talk about a resource specific to a firm what are those resources specific to a firm value to one firm exceeds its value to any other firm it could be a brand or whatever so so when you talk about coca cola the brand that actually stays with coca cola the value is just for coke it's not for somebody else and then of course there is something like resource specific to application or usage and that could be say value decreases when a firm applies it differently and this is a very important issue in fact you know, the most flexible resource in the world is say cash and then of course the, the there is something else on the other end which could be the most inflexible resource uh, which you cannot actually change or you cannot actually change the usage for it so what happens is like when you talk about your resources that could be say assets they, they are either flexible or inflexible to a nature uh, uh, to some to do something so when you talk about say firm specific resources it could be say brand building or whatever and then if you talk about usage spe specific resources restricts the firm's ability to change the way a resource is used a very simple point here what can i do with aircrafts now it's an asset that i actually purchase and i spend say 20 30 40 million dollars or even say 60 million dollars or 70 million dollars to actually acquire an aircraft and whether i actually lease it or whether i actually do an outright purchase or i actually purchase and then do some kind of a lease back arrangement or whatever uh, it's a bloody expensive proposition and once i do that what do you think my strategy is going to be to be in business so if you really look at this uh, whole thing aircrafts have just about three known usages in the world what do you think are those three known usages of aircrafts in the world uh, let, let let me just check uh, uh, that point with uh, somebody okay uh, yes rajiv uh, would you have something to say how how can i actually use uh, aircrafts what are the three known ways of using aircrafts now this is about asset flexibility you Carry. should yeah okay yeah sure please tell me that. sure i think uh, you probably uh, there are only three carry passengers carry goods uh, use it for defense and fighting okay and of course then there there has to be a fourth one so what are the fourth way of doing it or using it <laughs> use it as a missile uh, you know be in the business of renting or use it you, as a missile you you do a 911 right 
Oh my God! Yeah, yeah. Correct. <laughs> okay, correct. so like what I'm correct. trying to say here is that there are just typically two or three uses of aircrafts, and typically the industry that we are really talking yes. about, there are just two uses in or two usages for this aircraft. Uh, so when you either I can use it as a cargo thing, mm. or I could actually use it as a, a passenger aircraft. So I suddenly get into passenger. a situation where I cannot actually use this asset in any way whatsoever. Once I actually acquire it, I've got nothing to do with it. In fact, a very interesting case in point here on asset flexibility and how assets could be used. Uh, I'm sure you must have uh, you come from the same industry. Uh, you must have actually uh, uh, known a very significant player in the auto sector called Swaraj Tractors. Uh, so Swaraj actually got into scooters at one point in time, and their scooters did not do well. And uh, you know what what did they do with their factory? Now that's an asset that they actually created, but they did not lose money on that. They actually shifted the usage of that factory significantly to making something else. What do you think they were making in that factory? Where they were actually supposed to make scooters? I think they converted it into that uh, uh, Sonalika tractors or engines factory. No, uh, Sonalika was different actually. No. Okay. Okay, very interesting. Like this is about asset so flexibility. No, uh, you know what they did? They actually started making non-stick utensils in that factory. Surprise, surprise! Like, <laughs> <laughs> so that's but in, yeah, interesting. That, very yeah, interesting. Very interesting. Uh, in fact, now this is what about this is what is asset flexibility here. If I am able to have that kind of a thing, I know how can I actually make money out of the fixed cost that I've actually made. In the case of airline industry, the biggest problem that we face is that I actually make a fixed cost commitment, which is huge. I have to find a way to actually run that equipment, and if I'm not running that equipment, I'm actually going to uh, lose a lot of money. And now the whole battle that, if you really talk about, in case of say airline industry, is to actually uh, get some kind of return or some kind of uh, what you call revenues out of these uh, assets. If I'm not able to do that, then I'm actually going to lose on my fixed cost. I'm going to lose on the variable cost. In fact, keeping the aircraft on ground itself is bloody expensive. So I have to find a way to actually run it and recover some bits, recover some variable cost, and recover some bits of my fixed cost. So if you really look at the airlines, the business model gets skewed here itself, at the very base level. If I do not know how do I actually use my asset to the fullest possible extent, that means I'm not really going to make money. Why do you think Southwest makes money, or why do you think Singapore Airlines makes money, or why do you think Air Asia makes money? They actually make money for one single reason: that they're able to increase the usage of their aircraft. In fact, all of them would are typically using their aircraft that they actually have for greater than 16 hours a day. And when they're using their aircraft for say 16 hours a day, uh, that means they they are actually able to apportion that fixed cost over larger number of flights. So it actually becomes that apportionment of fixed cost over larger number of flights, and it actually makes the whole business model a little more viable. Say when I when I talk about a player like say Indian Airlines, which keeps on bleeding all the while, uh, why do you think they actually bleed? For a simple reason, they're not going to use their aircraft for more than eight hours a day, and they have to. Uh, and of course, they they actually get the aircraft at the same price, more or less, plus minus ten percent or whatever. Uh, but then they they're just not able to recover their fixed costs. And that's the same thing that is actually happening. In fact, one of the most successful airlines in the world is Ryanair, which has actually been able to make so much of money. And now they are actually, if you really look at asset, the usage of the asset, this usage of asset has to be looked at from two perspectives. And what are those two perspectives? Like one of them is that how do I actually in, use this aircraft for larger number of hours? And the second thing that I need to look at is how do I actually get more and more passengers into this aircraft? And now, if you really look at what Ryanair is trying to do, Ryanair is trying to do something which is exceptional, and they're saying that we are going to get people to stand on the aircraft for ev so something like uh, they are actually trying trying to create a new configuration on their aircrafts that, on a configuration which used to have something like close to 180 people on board, would actually have something like close to 250 people on board. And what does that mean? Like that means like suddenly I can reduce my prices, I can actually increase. Even if I marginally reduce my prices, the price elasticity is so high in this business that I would suddenly have larger revenue. Uh, people coming in, I'll have more seat occupancy or whatever. So my occupancy rates will rise. In fact, the challenge in this business is to actually get more and more passengers into your aircraft. 
In fact, the most perishable commodity or the most perishable service in the world is airlines. In fact, like once the aircraft doors get, get closed, you can't do anything about it. And that is where the challenge actually begins. So if you, if you really look at it, it, it starts with passenger load factor, which has to be greater than, say, 90%. There are airlines which have been making money at 70% as passenger load factor, but their pricing has been hugely different. But then there are airlines which are premium, like say probably British Airways, or in fact this year British Airways made a loss, but then Singapore Airlines, and uh, so on and so forth. So if, if you really look at it, now there is another thing that could actually come into action, and I, I think I did discuss this about at the time of performance, like it's not about ownership, it's about how, how smartly I actually build my business models. So the challenge in airline industry is about business models and getting the right business models, not about something else. Uh, in fact, if you really talk about that Air uh, uh, Sahara thing, that, that was uh, about getting more passengers in the aircraft. And of course, like there were people who were very smart, like say Murli, who would actually pick up Apex fares for the business tickets also. So that means they actually got their um, uh, whole process wrong because they did not understand that there are going to be people who could actually exploit the system. But now if you, if you actually look at, say, somebody like Air Deccan, Air Deccan did something very smart, and that was that they actually looked at the bottom of the pyramid kind of a thing, wherein they said, okay, uh, if you really look at the total, number of, the total number of people who travel in the country, 95% of people would actually be very price sensitive, and, uh, what, what, and what is their category motivation? They would say that they want to actually travel from one end of the country to the other end of the country during holidays, the programs would get fixed about good one or two months in advance. And so what, what these companies would say is, okay, now my program is fixed or the, the, the passenger's program is fixed, so let me actually sell him a ticket at a lower price and get a commitment. And if he actually moves out, I'm actually going to have a fine. So these were the two or three things that were actually happening. So commitment at that price band, looking at that band, and suddenly increasing the customer base. In fact, if you really look at the airline industry, the challenge today is, I think they are all fighting the wrong sets of battles. They're fighting a battle of market share. They're not understanding that we have to un look at expanding that whole num the set of people who are actually flying. Why can't we do that? Say, when you talk about a place like, say, Delhi to Chandigarh, why do you have to fly an A320 equipment on that uh, circuit? You could actually fly something else. Delhi Chandigarh is such a short flight. In fact, you could make money on that. Or in fact, if you really look at there are certain sets of sectors where airline companies are not even flying, even though it could be a bloody profitable route. So there is no flight from, say, Chandigarh to Calcutta. Why? Why, why can't we actually have a flight? In fact, there is one train which, which actually you don't find tickets on the train from Chandigarh to Calcutta called Kalka, and it's always full. And there are something like close to 1,500 seats on that uh, train every day. So that means there is a huge... Uh, load or there is a huge demand for that kind of a thing and so there, there is nothing like a regional thing that these guys are doing so there seems to be something wrong with the assessment of these guys uh, in fact uh, I'm actually helping one of the airline companies and we are actually looking at this data so I, I think if, if you really look at this data very closely you will find that it is about getting your business model right in fact the smartest guy in the country from my point of view was somebody like Air Deccan for a simple reason they said, okay, now they, they were very close to what Air Asia wanted to do at one point in time. In fact, in Air Deccan, they actually charged the pilot for food. And that's very interesting. They charged something like 200 rupees or 300 rupees from pilot for food. They were the first set of police to, uh, uh, players to actually eliminate uh, the, uh, the travel agents. And that is where, the, even in that case, they started making money. The only airline, if you actually use a credit card, you actually have to pay them. Uh, they, they actually do something like a 5% charge on credit cards or whatever. And so this is, this is what was actually happening. So they actually looked at the complete process of the airline and they started looking at revenue opportunities and cost-cutting opportunities. So it was about creating those powerful business propositions. So when you actually have an asset, which is a fixed asset, you have to find or you have to get your business models right. If you're not really getting your business models right, you're actually going to bleed to death. And I, I think airline industry is a very exciting industry to get into. I think we just don't play the game right. And then if somebody asks me a question, whether government should support it or not, or government should actually say, okay, whether we should actually uh, give a bailout package to airlines. No, they should not. There is a huge reason for it, and the reason is very simple. When these airlines make money, uh, they don't share it with the government. They are not actually doing something extra uh, to, to the country. They don't give something which is exceptional. So why should these guys actually be supported? When Vijay Malaya Sahib actually makes tons and tons of money, 
and he's not doing uh, what do you call he's not going to share that amount of money uh, and uh, what he's going to do is buy another yacht probably the largest in the world so why should we actually support him so i think people create their businesses and they actually lose money because of their own whimsy whimsical ideas and idiotic uh, business models that they actually create so th- this is what i wanted to say any comments on this i'll i'll i have time for one or two uh, quick comments and then uh, uh, what, what what do you call uh, then we'll go for closure A- any comments that somebody would like to make yeah so uh, Raj- rajiv uh, the point yeah the point on making a huge commitment and then keeping the asset flexible uh, was very well understood uh ekar for his best example question that i have is uh you know there there are periods in this industry when the uh when you when your objective is to get customers in uh whether you want to fish at the bottom of the pyramid or any other set and there are other people offering the same so you would fight your battle on pricing in discounts mhm now which means little bit of principle of saying maximizing yield so working on marginal cost and stuff like that what doesn't come in an entrepreneur's mind is is this sustainable but he still needs to do it because his flight door is going to close so filling your asset uh in this case an airline asset like an aircraft versus thinking about the sustainability of that and thereby you know building an expectation in the customer's mind that you know delhi bombay should cost me 3000 so when it is 5000 you know i'll think twice or something like that mm-hmm. just your point of view on that the second ill in this industry uh is the fact which i presume should be an ill in any manufacturing or any any industry per se is when we lose flexibility on stuff like labor when there is huge unions uh this has ailed the airline industry this has ailed the us automotive industry and you know if you look at the cost uh, model of the airline industry this fuel we have little control on uh there's capital cost but that can be done smartly like you said thinking about the right routes the right aircrafts and the, the third big cost is people mm-hmm. in this case you know 30 to 40% of the cost of an airline is its of its operating expenses its people mm-hmm. you know which with huge unions and all so if some type of a regulation exists which prevents unions which allows a certain base minimum price that you can charge for fuel etc maybe it allows people uh, uh, rajiv very interesting statistic here you know uh, about a year mm-hmm. back jet airways had actually uh, thrown out about 700 uh, ground crew do you remember that yeah. yes <laughs> and yeah, uh, yeah everybody yeah the dramatic yeah, day on television i i know Mr. like goel coming and saying he dreamt of his mother sorry <laughs> yes and well i i actually <laughs> went on uh, tv at that time and i was actually making a comment and i i looked at a few statistics at that point in time and you would be surprised to know that the salary of the 700 people was less than the salary of Naresh Goel Now that's some food for thought okay so if, if you really look Definitely. Definitely. so if if you really look at it i think it actually leads us to a very major issue that manmohan singh ji has actually been saying like how much money should a ceo actually make so we are not really going to get into that debate so but then the question is uh, when we actually look at say labor cost or whatever who who in, increases that labor cost i think the top management is always very heavy it's not the guy right. who's at the bottom who's actually creating that labor cost for you he might be unionized but then he's not really going to kill you it's always the top management which actually is going to increase your costs so i think the rational rationalization has to come from there in fact if you really look at the banking industry in us that has actually failed the major uh, i think it was uh, lehman brothers right which actually went down and you know in that single year the top management yep. had actually distributed dividend equal to 30 billion dollars to the top guys and now they actually just failed so that means it's the top management which is there yeah. so that was one uh, answer on that uh, you you had another question i just lost that question could you just remind me on that question the, it was on uh, giving discounts to maximize yield versus thinking about the sustainability of bringing the price point okay, down okay uh, uh, you know when a south yeah. i remember that question now mm-hmm. so so if you really look at this uh, whole idea of uh, getting uh, what do you call giving discounts there there are different ways in which mm-hmm. you can actually do it I think uh, when you talk about Air Deccan Air Deccan st- was actually giving discounts but they were understanding what was the category motivation. So if you really talk about a business right. traveler business traveler has a different category motivation he would be willing to pay for his travel. 
but then when you actually talk about mm. say somebody like uh, a, a guy like uh, probably who's not very rich or who's actually having a long uh, what you call drawn process of travel or whatever for him discounted ticket was okay so i i think there had to be a very big difference that you had to draw from a, a basically a business traveler and the normal traveler and how you could actually price yeah, these two guys you. differently so you have to get into these models and tra- trying to see like how this this can actually be worked out and i think the idea is how we can actually mm-hmm. get more and po- more people on the board i think the challenge is going to be uh, getting passenger load factors which are going to be always greater than 70% if i do not get a passenger load factor of greater than 70% then i'm going to be dead and then of course w- without uh, one caveat that you cannot get into a price war because the moment you get into a price war that means you are actually going to bleed yourself you're going to bleed yourself you're going to bleed others as well so it's a zero sum game and whatever it nobody is going to win out of this so i think we will talk about these price things and everything uh, somewhere down the line again in a much deeper way uh, from a de- uh, different perspective as well and i i'm sure we'll find some very interesting answers there so uh, the in fact like i'm sorry i have to uh, cut short this class uh, right now i have a train to catch in 1 hour 10 minutes and i have to go through this delhi traffic uh, to to towards uh, the railway station so uh, we have to close the session right now uh, thanks a lot for being here next session we are actually going to do two cases uh, they are going to be yahoo and uh, uh, matching dell so i would uh, request all of you to actually go through these two cases please go through your readings very very well and uh, this is what we are going to do in the next session and uh, most likely a session after that that is going to be on the 23rd we should have a guest speaker on the 23rd and most likely on the 30th as well 30th the speaker is confirmed called david wittenberg we might actually have the ceo of economist who's actually going to be in the studio with us and uh, uh, taking a couple of sessions with us so that might actually be on 23rd so uh, no no uh, what are your commitments right now but most likely he might be there sure so this is what i really wanted to do today uh, i'm sure uh, you're going to have a great uh, weekend ahead of you and uh, don't have monday blues and enjoy yourself uh, tomorrow Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.